So we saw how uh, the figure of the Minotaur, the half man, half bull, a creature was important to the representations of many artworks of uh, the Surrealist group. Um, the bull itself was of great interest to a number of artists, and it was particularly important to naturally the Spanish artist, you know, for whom uh, bullfighting is uh, still today, and maybe unfortunately so, uh, a national sport. Um, we will see that Picasso was, of course, central to this interest for the bull and for how much it represented uh, sexual potency. So this association with the figure of the bull, sexual potency, the labyrinth that we saw in the Masson painting is also something that was explored, for instance, by uh, Joanne Miro. So Miro is, like Dali, someone who grew up in Catalonia, this province of Spain with its capital in Barcelona, uh, which still today has a very large bullfighting arena. Uh, Miro is a very interesting figure in the Surrealist group because he sort of explores the whole range of possibilities of exploring the unconscious, first by using this sort of dream interpretation of classical paintings. You have, for instance, a Dutch painting representing a musician. So he, done his, he did his own interpretation of this by oversimplifying all the shapes in this initial painting from the 17th century. And simplifying and simplifying again all these shapes leads in sort of you know, the middle of his career uh, to images like this one, which is a representation of a bull with his, uh, you know, his sexual org reproductive organs very, very uh, amplified there because there was this, this strange uh, habit of bullfighting where uh, after they kill the bull, they have to cut usually the ears and very often the reproductive organs as a sort of trophy, so never mind. So this is sort of the, the emphasis made on this animal where a sexual potency is also somehow overemphasized. Uh, after this kind of oversimplification of shapes, eventually uh, Miro even went on the way towards pure abstraction, which is just shapes without any efforts to represent anything. So figurativeness is completely out of the picture. So this is sort of a, an in-between uh, moment in the production of uh, Johan Miro. But in this context, in the context of this exhibition, is interesting because of his uh, representation of a bull, which is again something that Picasso explored also in many paintings, and especially prints. So Picasso is sort of uh, the odd man out, maybe one of many in the Surrealist group. Uh, he was already a famous artist by the time uh, Breton and his group sort of come out. And Breton being Breton, he wanted to attract within the Surrealist group, and even try to control sometimes, uh, a number of the artists he felt had at least a little bit of you know, things in common with what they were exploring. So the paintings and prints that Picasso did of bulls and bullfighting, and this, this emphasis on, on sexuality that was really part of, of these illustrations of Picasso, uh, were something that attracted Breton quite early on. And when came the time for Breton and Georges Bataille to, to bury the hatchet and, and come together to finally produce something that was somehow bringing together the best of the, these two movements, uh, they both produced this very ambitious uh, literary and artistic review called Minotaur. So we have here the whole run, okay, that they did only basically 10 issue of the thing. Uh, this was published by a very famous Swiss a publisher called Skira. And uh, it was extremely expensive. You, you have to understand that um, magazines review like uh, the Surrealist Revolution of Breton, 
uh, documents by Bataille are basically black and white uh, publications. This is one of the early, all right, this is from since 19, the first issue was in 1937. There's a lot of color reproduction inside, which was at the time extremely expensive. Uh, they were, in fact, sponsored by uh, a couple of important aristocrats from France called the Comte de Noailles, who actually produced, gave them a lot of money to allow them to do this color reproduction. And the first issue of Minotaur is probably the most famous cover of the whole uh, uh, range. It was made by Picasso. So it's a collage. It's images glued together with, right in the center, uh, the figure of the Minotaur, the half-man, half-bull, uh, carrying a sword and, and looking very powerful and very dangerous, of course, which is the whole point. Uh, the second issue is probably more representative of how both Breton and Bataille came together, because they are, uh, in a sense, they are something that this issue is something that represents the content of both Document and Acephal, the, both, the two magazines that Bataille produced. And it is only dedicated to an ethnological trip made by ethnologists in uh, Western Africa, in the former French colonies of Africa. So it's called the mission from Dakar to Djibouti. Uh, a lot of photographs, a lot of ethnological text. Uh, the most visible one probably was by uh, Michel Léris, this great poet who was, uh, whose work was also published in, in Document. Uh, you can recognize a number. I don't recognize <laughs> every artist uh, in this array, but you know, for instance, this one is uh, by Marcel Duchamp, based on a series of, of uh, a kinetic works, uh, sculpt, you know, moving sculptures that he did. This one is by Miro, of course. Uh, this is Salvador Dali. Interestingly, this is Henri Matisse. So you would have to wonder what Matisse is doing here. Uh, Matisse was not a surrealist, of course, uh, but he had a son, uh, Pierre Matisse, who had uh, a very important art gallery in New York where all the surrealist exhibitions made in America were shown, all right? So they, they were closely related. The rest is, of course, uh, Magritte. And we end with uh, a cover by Masson, which is basically a reproduction of the head of the Minotaur in this other painting in the same room in the exhibition. Picasso and literally his obsession with uh, sexual potency that is very, very obvious in his erotic prints and his representations of the bull, of the minotaur, and so on, is something that, of, of course, is central to the theories of Sigmund Freud. Uh, although Breton himself was not particularly interested in this exploration of sexuality, uh, a lot of the artists, even within his group, did explore that. Uh, to be perfectly clear, this fascination with sexuality and its issue is more something that interested Georges Bataille, all right? And Bataille himself wrote a number of short stories and novels about sexuality. Uh, for him, sexuality was one of the ways to, to transgress the conservativeness of you know, Western culture in general. Um, it's not something we associate often with Magritte, all right? but this is a work of René Magritte, the Belgian artist. Uh, in passing, we should note that there were a lot of poets and artists in Belgium that were French-speaking Belgian that were very, very close to the Surrealist group. Uh, at some point, even Magritte uh, moved away from his native Belgium to move to Paris to be closer to Breton. Um, the work of Magritte tends to be, uh, I would say, more of an exploration of the meaning of representation. What do we do when we do a painting? What is a representation of something? And this led to one of his most famous paintings because it was you know, explored and interpreted and, and written about by many philosophers most famous of them, Michel Foucault, the painting of the pipe with the text, this is not a pipe. 
And of course, it's not a pipe because it's a painting of a pipe. You can't do anything with this. You know, you can't smoke it. You can't hold it. And he did a lot of paintings about what we call indexicality. You know, the index is this finger, and you use the finger to show something. And a lot of painting is about this, showing something. So he did a lot of paintings, a lot of work related to that question, but not just, of course. Uh, you have a lot of paintings, for instance, with one character with a bowler hat, which is about uh, the conservatism of, of most of you know, the people living in Europe at the time and how you can do something against this. And I, I would say that this questioning of the conservativeness of society is something you, can, you basically can see in this very, very, very famous painting uh, with a very suggestive title. It's the rape, okay. So I must say, but you, know, you can't really criticize them for that because this is after all the 1920s and 1930s. But let's face it, uh, women are a bit of a blind spot for surrealism. There are very few surrealist, female surrealist artists. And uh, it's kind of understandable also by the fact that, you know, Freud developed his theories about little boys. Uh, girls were not much of a concern to Freud until very late in his career. So this painting representing a, a sort of a a hybrid, maybe this can even be seen as a chimera, a hybrid of a face and a body, with a title like The Rape, is really about the objectification of the female body, turning women into an object, an object of desire. All right. So again, uh, we should not criticize them for looking at this topic in this light, because you know, this was in the 1930s. But again, this is a really a blind spot in surrealism that tends to treat women as an object. Okay? And this is very clearly the case in this painting. This painting had a, a very interesting afterlife because in uh, the early 1970s, uh, the Rolling Stones uh, produced an album called Angie. It's a very famous song. And the cover of the album is a photography of the body of a woman with very long hair that looks exactly that like this painting. Uh, the only difference is that in the photo of the Rolling Stone album, uh, you have a sort of a pop art uh, mouth, lips on the body of that photography. So this painting had a very interesting afterlife in uh, rock and roll music in the 1970s, in fact. So uh, talking about sexuality and the issues related to sexuality, we can move on to this painting. No, sorry, a drawing by Pierre Klosowski. So, Klosowski is much more famous as a writer than he is as a painter or an illustrator. He did a lot of, dr of of drawings, uh, however, of this character, this lady, which he called Robert. And uh, in, this paint, in this drawing, sorry, he explores a, a number of the issues that were more often explored by writers, and especially writers connected to uh, Georges Bataille, than of painters. So first, we have to note the very important detail that uh, Pierre Klosowski's younger brother is one of the most famous artists of the 20th century. It's the painter Balthus. And Balthus is very famous for doing all these representations of interiors with uh, very, very young girls uh, fully dressed, but in very, very provocative uh, attitudes. All right. So uh, I, I would say that uh, it would be nearly impossible for an artist today to do things in the representation of children that are very sexualized. Uh, it would be impossible. Okay. But Balthus was, in his days, one of the most famous artists of the 20th century and the younger brother of Pierre Klosowski. So Klosowski, with his exploration, of twisted sexuality, in fact, explores something very close to what his brother was exploring. So 
in this painting of Robert called the beautiful Versailles. So Versailles is a person living in the city of Versailles, where you know, the famous castle palace by Louis XIV uh, still stands. And Versailles, uh, since the time of Louis XIV, and to this day, is very famous for uh, its inhabitants that, are, that tend to be very rich, uh, upper middle class, and extremely conservative. So th this, this is very typical of the novels of uh, Pierre Klosowski, where uh, he likes to put uh, conservative bourgeois in very embarrassing positions. So this, this beautiful woman with a very classical hat, which really shows that she belongs to the upper class, is being brutalized by two young men in the streets and being made put, you know, her clothes are being torn off. Typical of the kind of uh, sexually oriented novels, short stories that Klosowski would produce and that also uh, Georges Bataille would produce. Bataille also wrote a number of uh, short stories about sexuality, which for him was one way to transgress the conservativeness of uh, his uh, period, his, his epoch. Um, since we're in Hong Kong, it's also interesting to note that Pierre Klosowski, uh, he wrote extensively about uh, the Marquis de Sade. So you know the term sadism, which means you, know, you, you take sexual gratification in hurting people. Uh, Marquis de Sade was an 18th century writer who wrote a lot of novels about this. Uh, and Klosowski wrote extensively about this. So he was very interested in sexual transgression, violence and stuff like that. And he interestingly translated into French one of the most uh, disturbing erotic novels of China. Um, the English translation of the title is uh, The Carnal Prayer Mat, or the, the Flesh as a Prayer Mat, is Ro Pu Tuan. Uh, I, you, you can Google it. I don't want to tell about the story. It's really disgusting, all right? It's a late 17th century novel written in China by a writer called Li Yu, although we're not sure who it is exactly. And uh, I have sort of a personal connection with this because uh, Klosowski could not read Chinese. So in order to do his translation, he relied on a word-by-word -word translation of the Chinese that was established by one of my professors <laughs> when I was studying Chinese in Paris in the 1980s. So although I never, you know, I never met Klosowski uh, myself, but I knew very well that professor who helped translate the Roput one uh, into French. So the exploration of sexuality and especially its darker uh, orientation is also something that was explored by, by this artist. Uh, to be honest, this is the first time I see uh, these originals. I, I'm really stunned by how small they are. <laughs> you usually see them in magazines. And in fact, it was published in Minotaur. Uh, and uh, it's the work of Hans Bellmer, uh, a German artist, I guess you can say that, uh, from Karlsruhe, who, who created a doll, which is really a representation of basically everything that can go wrong with the body. The body dismembered, the body twisted, the body tortured. Uh, this was, for instance, a strong inspiration uh, for the works of much later artists who precisely explored questions related to the body and sexuality, in particular, uh, the French artist who became an American citizen, Louise Bourgeois, whose work is all about you know, what goes wrong with the body. So this is much earlier. This is in the 1930s. So Belmer created that doll, made a series of photographies of the doll in, in various positions. And, and all of it seems to be about, again, sexuality that goes wrong, that, that, that creates issues. And he sent, uh, I think you have the cover here, he sent self-published versions of this to the Surrealist group in Paris. They were completely fascinated and, and reproduced a, a number of these photos. So th these photos were also uh, recolored uh, by the artist, sort of emphasizing 
the, I would say the, the, the natural aspect of it, ma making it even more clearly a representation of the flesh, of the body. And uh, I was really stunned by the choices made by the Museum of Art in putting these photos in a separate room. Uh, I guess it's also a way to avoid uh, children <laughs> having access to these images, uh, which is interesting because you know, there's nothing, there's no naked body, there's no representation of sexuality, but the way the doll is represented, the way, the way it looks is disturbing. And when you start analyzing why they're so disturbing, it's not quite obvious why, all right? But again, this has to, something to do with the fact that it is reminiscent of something going wrong with the body. And, and the last choice they made for this room is very interesting because it, it's red. The whole room is red. And, and also <laughs> this, you know, my, my background is in, in comparative aesthetics. So I, I do a lot of work on art theory from Europe and from China and comparing them. And I can't help thinking that, you know, red in China is a, is a lucky color. It's a happy color. And it's true that, I don't want to generalize too much, but red tends to be uh, a color about sex, about brothel, about forbidden sexuality in, in Western culture, in European culture. So I wonder what the public will make in Hong Kong of this particular choice of red for this room, which is very much about sexuality. So uh, the, the surrealists, all of them were um, violently anti-fascist. They militated against fascism. They did artworks against fascism. Uh, during the Spanish Civil War, for instance, um, Johan Miro, who was in France, militated, raised money for the Republican cause in Spain. We've seen Picabia uh, make this, portrait, this painting about dictators. Uh, and when uh, the Nazi eventually uh, invaded France, many of them uh, decided to leave. Uh, and they, most of them, uh, first to London, of course, and then to America. And Breton, for instance, was in New York for a number of years. Uh, Marcel Duchamp, of course, had arrived earlier, had been there for a long time. Uh, another painter called Yves Tanguy, even married, uh, an American artist in New York and stayed there. Max Ernst was also in America. And uh, they did have a very strong influence on the New York art scene in the 1940s. So uh, we can start here with this painting by uh, Achille Gorky. Gorky was an Armenian, so born in the since still the Ottoman Empire, Turkey, uh, the Armenian people had been persecuted and were the victim of a genocide. Okay, so uh, moving away was a question of survival for someone like Gorky. Uh, he, however, felt like a foreigner in America for a long time. And even though his first uh, foray into art uh, was in following both Picasso and Braque in Cubism. Uh, the moment he discovered surrealism, he became close to the group of Breton who were in New York at that time. And surrealism became his new, new avenue in the exploration of art. Uh, this painting has a very interesting title. It's called Landscape Table. And uh, you can literally see the table, and you, you, you have to see this as basically something coming out of cubism. You know, the cubist artists were trying to represent single objects from all possible sides into a composition, into the artwork. And here you can recognize people sitting around a table with stuff on the table. This might be a, a plate. This might be a, a terrine, you know, objects you find on a table with the stand of the table, chairs, and so on. Uh, however, all these elements are somehow recompositioned into something else that is also reminiscent, at least in the mind of the artist, of a landscape, okay? So this is the sort of exploration that, in fact, you can see someone like Miro do, all right? 
And in the case of Achille Gorky, this also has something to do with, for him, the possibility of surrealism and this exploration of the unconscious as a return to his roots into Armenian culture. Not directly so, but at least as a, a reminiscence of childhood. Okay? And, and again, I don't think we speak enough about the importance of childhood for the surrealists. Okay? A lot of their work is basically games. Games about memory, about you know, the roots of who you are as a human being. And in this case, in the case of Achille Gorky, this man unrooted from his cultural background living in America, this was a very precious way to conduct new exploration into his own experience as a human being. Gorky is basically the first in a whole generation of artists who became extremely famous in the 1950s and we usually call the abstract expressionist. So abstract expressionism uh, is often also called the New York School because they were mostly based in New York. And even though you cannot claim that all the aspects of abstract expressionism have something to do with surrealism. Uh, for instance, you know, you have the this branch of abstract expressionism called color field. Mark Rothko is the main representative of this branch. I don't think you can see surrealism in the work of Mark Rothko. Maybe so, but I don't believe so. Uh, however, the idea of automatism, the use of accidents into making art, is really something that has its roots in surrealism, right? This is what Duch sorry, what Breton and his friends have been exploring for already 20 years, basically. And this has a very important impact on the work of this artist, even though not especially in this work. Uh, you, you can argue that some parts of these paintings are gestural, and this is related to automatism, but a lot of it are motifs and colors that Jackson Pollock, in fact, explored. Uh, as a young man, he did a long trip across America and went into contact with a Native American culture, especially the Navajo in Arizona. Uh, you have a video, in fact, in the exhibition showing uh, Native American ritual dances. And Pollock was initially very interested in this. And he was particularly interested when he visited the Navajo uh, in the fact that they were doing sand painting. They were making very often geometrical forms illustrating their legends using colored sand on the ground. All right. Uh, these were works that were not made to last. Okay? They would be swept away because these are nomadic peoples. So they, they would move away and so on. So this idea that accident is very productive in terms of you know, creation of forms that the unconscious basically sort of, you know, it's the wrong way to put it, but it guides your hand in these accidents. Working on the ground, which is this exploration of non-Western culture that in fact surrealism encouraged from the beginning. This is all formative for the work of Jackson Pollock. So even though this painting, uh, I think that's the only Jackson Pollock uh, the Pompidou Center has, <laughs> okay? But Jackson Pollock today is more famous for his invention of the idea of action painting. The way he was working was like the Navajo doing sand painting. He would put the canvas on the ground, use big buckets of paint, no brush, sticks, and then he would drip the paint, all right, and do very complex compositions uh, doing that. This is all taken directly from this idea of automatism, accidents, this exploration of Native American culture that was all encouraged by the Surrealists. Um, to conclude, I think it's also interesting to see that because abstract expressionism is initially described by the art historians and art critics who were the first to defend it, like, like Clement Greenberg, for instance, they emphasized the Americanness, the American nature of abstract expressionism. And even though 
nobody questioned the notion that surrealist ideas, and because they were in America, you know, Breton was in America, surrealist ideas were very important for Jackson Pollock to produce the idea of action painting because the emphasis was on the American nature of that school. The initial art historians and art critics who described the works of abstract expressionists preferred to put aside the European source of many of these ideas. So this painting is also very interesting because it fits into this exploration of myth from other cultures that, you know, the, the whole experience of these exhibitions also uh, emphasizes. <laughs>